Aaron Odom. I am the owner, artistic director, managing director of Trident Theater. And from the age of 10, I got my first taste of the stage and knew that that's what I was gonna do for the rest of my life. <laughs> there is a way that you can connect to things that speak to, for lack of a better word, the soul. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's about being able to find yourself appreciating a form of expression that you might not have thought you could find yourself connecting to, whether it's through dance, whether it's through song, whether it's through the spoken word. A lot of my career, <laughs> I really thought that theater was supposed to be a lot more pedantic than I've, <laughs> I've come to realize that it is. I'm like, here's a message, we've got to grind it into these people. You need to walk away from here understanding this thing. And then I realized, no, it's, it's not our job. Our job here is to ask questions, or at least just make people ask them. There's been a huge <laughs> fundamental part of my delivery of theater that came from a stand-up act I saw a long, long time ago. And it was about being able to ask fundamental questions, like the way the stand-up comedian put it, am I gay? And sometimes the answer is, no, no I'm not. Or maybe it's, yeah, I am. And now you've had that revelation, and now you have to figure out what to do with that. Storytelling is a fundamental part of Western culture. We're making a show accessible. We're saying, hey, you can understand the Scottish play. You can understand uh, the histories. You can understand comedies. It's not that hard. There's themes and everything to it. Because they speak in an Elizabethan uh, poetry, that you, you're, it's not accessible to you. It's absolutely accessible to you. Some days I wake up with the most intense desire to know what day it is. Uh, Sunday, Thursday. I feel like I'm going to die the next minute if I can't figure it out. And then other days I wake up and I realize that it, months have gone by. Well, they must have gone by since I last had a conscious thought about time. <sighs> makes me feel like the astronaut who's traveled 40 years at the speed of light and then returns home no older. Oh, time must be for them, he thinks. I never thought of time as like a coat. You can take it off and put it on again. Too cold to live without it, so we hug it to ourselves. We, we have to, because time has changed. All the time has changed. And when there's no change. Yesterday, one of my guards told me I'd been here for three years. I didn't know what he meant. I'm Stephanie Wilkerson and I live in Sheridan, Wyoming. I'm a metalsmith. Uh, I actually grew up in a very artistic family. Everyone in generations back had a medium. My grandpa was a sculptor uh, with wood and he was also a painter. My grandma was a ceramic artist and I have cousins. Everyone has these little things and jewelry honestly just kind of came into my life. We, we wear bold things in my family. <laughs> and I would find that I didn't have a piece that really described who I was when I was wearing it. It was always a statement thing. And so I started making with little findings, pieces that were already, I could purchase or were provided, but I found that it never actually completed what I pictured in my head. I was very limited because I couldn't make everything I imagined. And so that's actually what spurred me to begin learning the art of metalsmithing. I wanted to be able to create from beginning to end what I came up with in my head instead of using pieces from other people. 2013 was my intro into the art of the torch. <laughs> and from then on, I, I just became addicted as far as how I was able to tell 
the story of each piece from beginning to end and had this pride in knowing that every piece was fabricated by hand by me and there was no turning back after that. I'm not a sketcher. I don't plan it out beforehand. I really, really love for the natural elements to tell me what to do. So I start with the stones and then go to the metal and everything starts with just this plain sheet of sterling silver and a lot of steps have to go into the process before it ever turns into something wearable. Like This is my art form. This isn't just something that I can turn into a business. Like This is part of my soul that I'm pouring into every piece and I actually have to protect that, like that's sacred. And I feel like that's the difference between a business owner and an artist. I'm honored to wear the badge of an artist. Uh, it's a challenging one to wear sometimes and I have to give myself grace. Um, it's okay that I didn't make anything this week. It's okay that I did that and I took a little break and I took some time for me because now I'm rejuvenated and I'm going to make art that's going to speak to people and that is the gift I'm giving them on top of just a beautiful ring to wear or a necklace to wear around their neck that's from a special memory in their lives. I think one of my favorite things about the art of metalsmithing is there's never a limit to how much you can learn, to how much you can push yourself. Uh, there's always something more challenging down the way in every piece. Um, finding the balance of what your niche is as a metalsmith is also <laughs> a little bit of it. Like I, I don't necessarily need to go make pave set diamonds and an engagement ring and 14 karat gold. I, that, I love that it's an art form in and of itself. But what I love is the more rustic handcrafted, the stone is the feature and they're all different. And the success of a jeweler is gonna be different because of what speaks to you. My name is David McDougall. I'm a painter. I do watercolors, but primarily acrylic on board or panels. I've been painting um, most of my life, but off and on to, you know, lean times when I couldn't paint much because I didn't really um, have much of an income, so I had to do other things. I've done a lot of different things in my life. I'm 72 years old. Uh, my brother and I are both real pretty, pretty heavily artistic, and we have no clue where it comes from. Uh, my, my dad came from North Dakota from a farming family, and my mother came from uh, South Dakota, and no one in her, in her family was artistic uh, somewhere, but we don't really know where it comes from. For me, it's all instinctive. I don't really have a color formula, but I, I, that's to me my biggest asset, I think, is the color. The color really um, brings it all together for me. I mean, if I was just drawing black and white, I mean, I could compositionally still succeed, but it's the color. And that, that draws people in. You know, the color is what grabs them, whether they like the composition or what I'm doing. But you can grab people with color. It's like a trap. It's me. That's what. That's who I am. I mean, I like puns and visual puns and things that show sort of who I am. I think that's essential for what I do. Um, and Donna, I love to show Donna stuff. When I'm finished painting, I'll say, "You gotta come see this," and I will uh, show her something like like that rattlesnake there. And uh, those are all things that are reality around here, you know? That owl is a reality here. I've seen owls with, oh, dead animals in our yard. I mean, they're funny, but they're also frightening. It's, it's a two-edged sword. And they deal with, it's, my stuff is also about mortality. It's both sides. If I was forced into, uh, selling what I make, 
I would probably not be able to paint like this. I would probably have to be painting elk, pictures of elk and fishermen, those sorts of things. And it wouldn't be me. It wouldn't be my soul or my heart. I don't think you have to sell your own. I don't believe that at all. I mean, I think it's almost... Art is such a wide definition. Something that's, that's created that can't be anything else. For me, that's sort of what it is. This, I, I stick with that. My name is Erin Waddell. I am from Sheridan, Wyoming. I'm an oil painter. My parents are uh, incredibly brilliant, both. My mother is a scientist, my dad an artist, and I think that combination has made me um, the person I am filled with curiosity. Both artists and uh, scientists are very curious about the world, and I, I absolutely love that combination. And the, the golden ticket for me was being raised on a ranch in Montana. I'm very proud of my father, and I think he is one of the best painters, living painters. He's still alive. He is turning 80 this year. My life has taken a very different path from my father's. In the case of my father, art always first, and family and other things second. And for me, family community comes first, and art has come second. I'm okay with that. I will never be famous and that's okay, um, but I have invested many years and hours into other people and some of it's through art. I believe um, fundamentally to whom much is given, much is expected. And so my mantra has been to work hard to give, to see others. And sometimes the artist brain um, and the artist lifestyle is uh, dare I say, egocentric, narcissistic, because it's all about, you know, my dream, my vision, and artists can be narcissists, and I'm definitely not a narcissist. I feel like my gifts, besides making art, are to teach art and to love one another, to love each other, to love humanity, and so there's lots of layers in that. My work often is misunderstood, but I think it's a lack of actually trying to think about these things metaphorically or conceptually. Uh, so education is critical. This painting is called Whose Flag? And it's, it's, um, it's come together around the concept of, in our country, who gets to control the icon of the flag? And I was frustrated during these last few years uh, about um, certain individual getting to ride around in their trucks with the American flag, and it's my flag too. So it's using icons, so you see the red, red, white, and blue. I really want the viewer to be excited. I don't have all the answers for them to walk away, perhaps, with their own answer. I tell my children and my students all the time, I don't want you to walk out and say, well, the sky is blue. The sky isn't blue. If you walked out right now, the sky is not blue. But why? Why is it blue? What about that? What, what, what is the why? So that's, that's my greatest desire, is for people to be curious and to come away with more versus um, pure replication. I've been mixing in joy and not just darkness. So if you look at my work, even if I'm struggling with the politics of it and it keeps me awake at night, I think humor and joy captivates more people than, than darkness. I think there's a, an engagement piece there. My name's James Jackson. It's my father, he was a saddle maker. He worked for the old Ernst. He was a Wyoming cowboy. Yeah, I really don't consider myself as a saddle maker. I asked my father once, how many saddles do you have to build to become a saddle maker? He said, oh, about a hundred. I never got into that.
territory. My focus really has been on doing custom articles out of leather. People who can do all those kinds of things are harder to find than the saddle makers are probably. I'm a leather worker. Material, it has a different qualities to it. What I like about it is it's tied into this, the culture that I live in. This is cow country. There are lots of cowboys and ranchers and, and this is where the skins from the leather come from. It's an interesting connection to your culture and uh, I've always enjoyed that sort of thing. Being an artist, you're aware of, of things like that. I tried to get away from it for a while, but it kept drawing me back. And then I realized at one point, leather tooling on, on cow skins and so forth, it's really an interesting process. And uh, since I, had a, I knew how to work with the material very well, something that just automatically tied into my everyday experience and it just became part of my art form. Use this little tool and it's rounded on the front and <laughs> if you're going to cut a uh, like a large surface you have to use this knife, you have to draw the entire thing with your knife and, and cut those lines. When I do this, you will see that it starts to develop uh, that quality that's more three-dimensional. Doing the leather work and the painting, it's, it's a passion for me. Something that I get up in the mornings and I'm already thinking about my work and what I need to do. I work late in the night and I get up and I, I'm, I'm just recharged. I just start all over again. I'm getting to be an old guy now, but I, that passion has not changed for me. I'm just so thankful because I have a lifetime and a career where I've had the luxury. I mean, don't get me wrong, it's been hard work and lots of long hours and if you're an artist that's what you have to deal with but the rewards that you get that keeps you going the thing is it, if it keeps feeding you and you keep getting you know something back uh, you can't wait to get to the next project and having a career like that where every day you get up it's it's a joy I'm Sonia Kaywood. I'm a painter of animals and just my surroundings. I always wanted to, you know, as I said, it was my dream, always. The big catalyst that, that made me realize I had to paint was in 1996. We lost our third daughter in labor. We'd gone in to have her, you know, she, I was in labor and she, she was stillborn. She had a cord around her neck. and. And that was so tragic, and I found that I really needed the art to get me through it, you know. And, and so my faith and my art really became my therapy, getting through that, and it really got me going. When I look at, at God's creation, I just see so many colors, and I see just light. I, I love the light. I like the the mix of abstraction and realism and how you could break things down into shapes and colors and values and I like to put it down so that a person can actually see that so they can see something that looks like oh that's a really pretty picture and then they get close and realize wow it's just it's a bunch of abstract shapes and that, that excites me. Sometimes people will say I've heard them say things like your cow it loves me I can just tell it loves me <laughs> So love is important to me and I think if somebody can look at some paint on a canvas and see love and feel that feel something for this this object that I've created this a representation of an animal that's out eating grass all day that doesn't really love you I think if you can add that kind of 
personality or emotion to a to a cow that's pretty cool <laughs> it feels good <laughs> and i believe anybody can become an artist i do i some people are born with this natural ability and i was born with natural ability not like a lot of artists i know though you know i know a lot of artists that have loads more ability but um, i think you also have to have a passion and a desire to express that to people so that they look at your work and they feel that you want to share that love with them and I think it's such a heartbreaking thing when when somebody with a lot of talent kind of just doesn't doesn't pursue it when they just they quit it or they get so hung up on the income let go of what really really might have been a great gift that they could have given to the world <laughs> we are surrounded by things here that are just gorgeous that I love and have a history with that I have an, an, a knowledge of and I just I, I couldn't be more happy I just need to open your door and look around look around you you don't have to go anywhere and it's true I realize I can I can stand in my backyard and paint I'm I'm so lucky <laughs>